Okay, everyone, are we ready to start here? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, um, once again, check the slides. Uh, they've been updated um, for today. Uh, added a few additional slides to help us out a little bit. Um, also, uh, one correction from uh, yesterday. Let me point out a correction from yesterday here. Yesterday. Yeah. So we talked about, remember, radioactivity um, in space. Um, I said light curves from supernova 1A are, are consistent with cobalt 56 decay. That's true. Uh, that is true. But um, I, I put the wrong half-life down. I put the half-life down for cobalt 60, which is on the other line, of course. We also see cobalt 60 in space as well. But the cobalt 56 is really prominent in, in supernova 1A. In, in fact, a lot of nuclei around iron and nickel and copper. Uh, are made pretty extensively in type 1A supernova. So, so do note the correction there, okay? 77 days for cobalt 56. And by the way, if you don't know what the, what the half-life of, of a nucleus is, what would you do? If you don't know the half-life of, of some nucleus. Oh, we, check, we check in the table. Of yeah, exactly. Yeah, this table that I gave you yesterday. So, so you never have to memorize them. Um, if you use them a lot, you get you get to learn what they are, but never remember. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, yesterday I was messing around with the table of isotopes. Right. And, uh, is all the data are uh, theoretical or uh, they are measurements? Oh, good question. So the question is: Yesterday uh, we were looking at the table of isotopes. Are the data theoretical or measured? Um, if the measured data exists, it is in the table. If it's theoretical, um, they will tell you somehow. And many times uh, in the table, they will either put a, a, a symbol in front of it. Uh, many times you will see this, which means we don't know it's a theory. Or sometimes they will write it in italics. So if, if it's well known, for example, you might see something like that. If it's not well known, you'll see a, you know, a fancy. Okay. And also, you, sometimes you'll see the uncertainty in there. So they'll put a digit that might be uh, um, in italics afterwards, and that's the uncertainty in the last digit. Ah. So so. Yes, I was looking. Uh, I was. Uh, I asked. Uh, I did. I wondering what there was that number. Yeah, on the uncertainty in the last uncertainty. digit. Sometimes if it's if it's two numbers, for example, it's it's the uncertainty in the last two digits. Wow. Of course, that, that, that would be a big uncertainty, right? That's a 160% uncertain in that case. So, yep, um, that's a really good question. And different tables may have different conventions, but very often you'll see some indicator, either a different font or a different symbol in front of it. Other questions? Yeah. Yep. How wrong do you do we usually ask? I mean, you said that uh, sometimes we have uh, some data that are just theoretical, but how many times it, um, it happened, or maybe it's in the past, that uh, some data are theor just theoretical and then the practical ones are totally different or much different? All, uh, all the time. Uh, all, yeah, many, many, all the time almost. Um, so the question is, is how often is the theoretical data completely wrong? Yeah. And, and of course it depends. Um, I'm going to show you an example today where the, the theoretical data seems like we should really know it, but we don't know it very well. It, it's, it's off by uh, um, quite a bit, uh, maybe 10% or so, which is a lot in this case. For um, theoretical masses, um, in many cases, they can be off by uh, uh, two or three or more times, depending on what the mass is. There's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem. Uh, it, it, it could be a problem, and we'll talk about how those uncertainties affect what we know. Usually, they're the very exotic masses. If, if we have time next week, I'll talk about how we do that, how we understand those. That's a, that's a really good question. Yep. Other questions? Okay. Um, so so yesterday. Uh, we ended here. We ended at this point. How, we talked about how fast does a nuclear reaction occur in a plasma. And um, it depends on these things here. It depends on the number density of the nuclei that are involved. How many of them have you put in the box? 
It depends on their cross sections, how, how big they are. Now, um, note, be careful, these cross sections depend on the energy. And, and that's a result of quantum mechanics. Uh, usually, if, if, if I'm just doing pool balls, the cross section is the size of the ball, right? In quantum mechanics, the cross section will depend on, on the energy. And it's almost like it's fuzzy, kind of. And it, it depends on the speed of the nuclei. If, if they're moving around faster, they will collide faster. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to figure out the average reaction rates. We'd like to take, take all the energies of all the nuclei in there, multiply by their cross section and their speed, and, and then average over all of those. Of course, there's a whole spectrum of energies, right? And so let me show you a little math. The math is, is really kind of nice. It, it explains itself very well. Um, uh, if you don't quite understand it all, that's okay because I will show you what the important parts are. So, so here's the, this is the mathematical statement of what I just said. This is from the previous slide. This is everything in one mathematical statement. The reaction rate is, is the number density of, of these two nuclei involved. So we call them A and B, for example, times the cross section times their speed. Okay, so that's, that's everything in one place. Now, what we want to do is we really want to take an average over all of that, okay? Now, the number density, we know. We, we, we could say if we have an environment, we know the exact number density. There's no real average, but they're all moving at different speeds, right, because of thermodynamics. And so we average over all of the speeds. And so to do that, we, we use we use the what, what we showed yesterday, the Maxwell-Boltzmann velocity distribution, okay? The probability, um, the probability, P is the probability that you are moving with some speed, V, E is the probability, or the probability that you're moving with some energy, because you can turn speed into energy. And of course, if, if you add them all up, which is, which is what the integral means, you, you should get one. The probability that it's moving at any speed, including zero. So what we do is we really want this, this, this average rate here. We want that average reaction rate. Uh, um, yesterday, someone said, is that the expectation value? Uh, yes, it is. Um, uh, even in quantum mechanics, it, it's an expectation value. Okay. So what is that average rate? Um, well, uh, uh, V times the probability is, is integrated over all that times the cross section is the average V, v times sigma, right? So you take the, the velocity times the cross section, multiply by the probability that you, you have that velocity, and then you add them all up, it's, it's taking an average. And of course, when you take an average over a little tiny interval, it, it just becomes an integral. And so, so uh, you don't have to know if you're still beginning in calculus, it, it's not so important, but um, to know that the integral there just means you're adding them up, you're taking the average, right? And so then what we do is we take this average here and we substitute. And, and of course, there's some constants out front. Those constants come from uh, uh, converting units and other things. I'm not too worried about the constants. You're converting uh, a, a velocity to an energy, so there has to be a mass in there. Um, you're converting uh, a velocity distribution to an energy based on temperature. So there has to be a, a temperature that you're making a substitution. But this is what we call the average, the average reaction rate, the, the thermonuclear reaction rate. It's the energy of a nucleus times the probability that it has that energy, which, which is this exponent, times the cross section. And that's it. That, that's what we call a thermonuclear reaction rate. This, this here, this here is probably the basis of all of nuclear astrophysics. It's this, this equation, um, if, if you go into ast nuclear astrophysics, you'll use this all the time. Um, it comes up almost every day. Let's talk a little bit about the cross section. Let's talk about how we get that cross section, okay? Um, I'm just gonna show you a slide. I'm not going to derive it for you, but I will talk a little bit about it. Okay, so, so the cross section depends on a couple things. If I have two nuclei, and let's assume right now that we just have positively charged nuclei, okay, they, they want to repel each other, 
like charges we got. So I have to exert some energy, I have to do work to get them close to each other. Well, that, that's true in quantum mechanics too. But of course, the magical quantum mechanical word is, is, is barrier penet penetrability, the probability that those two nuclei will interact, the probability that they will undergo what we call quantum mechanical tunneling. Okay. Uh, if you don't understand the uh, WKD approximation, that's uh, just fine. Um, that's uh, probably quantum mechanics two or something like that. But that's that's how we do it. Um, this second term here, you, you can sort of think of as the the quantum mechanical size of a nucleus. In quantum mechanics, we don't deal with um, a, a, a ruler and a measurement, a tape measurement. We deal with wavelengths because everything is a wave function in quantum mechanics. And then this, this last term here, um, this, this term S, we call that the astrophysical S factor. That's just where all the nuclear physics is. That has to do with the shape of the nucleus, the, the energy, the structure of the shell model, the stuff we talked about yesterday, okay? And so if we put all that in and, and it's color coded, you, the colors match here, the cross section it, it is something like that, um, where this term eta, very famous term, it's called, called the Sommerfeld parameter, um, uh, after the person who, who developed this, this method here. That's just equal to, to, to this quantity here, z1, z2, e squared over h bar, h bar, uh, Planck's constant over two pi times the velocity. Okay, so, so, and of course, we can take the velocity and, and make it look like an energy, one half mv squared. Um, so the velocity is something like a square root of an energy. Okay, and so that's it. The, the, this, is a, this is a cartoon that shows quantum mechanical tunneling. If you've studied that before, then, then the, you, you probably understand this. If not, that's okay. Just understand that the cross section looks like this, okay? Um, let me ask you real quickly, as the energy gets larger, if, if a nucleus has larger kinetic energy, what happens to the cross-section? Increases, exactly, because the velocity gets bigger. The velocity gets bigger, this gets smaller. When this gets smaller, the, the, the whole thing gets, gets bigger. Okay, so absolutely right. Increases cross section increases with energy. Um, normally, well, not normally, but quite often, this factor here it, it, uh, is assumed to be a constant because it changes very slowly for more or less spherical nuclei. There are times where where it's not a constant, um, where you have what we call resonances, and I won't talk about resonances today. But there are a couple slides at the end if you just want to look at resonances and read a little bit about them. It's where the cross section shoots way up and, and, and then at a certain energy. Yes, question. Uh, does the E in the denominator uh, stands for energy or something else? Yeah, E in the denominator is energy. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, and so, so I, I'm mixing my, my variables here, right? V can be energy, E could be energy, but yep. Okay. And so I put all that in and I, I get my, my average reaction rate. This is just the same equation from two slides ago. But what you want to look at is it depends on the, the cross section, which is this in red here. And it depends on the thermodynamic distribution, which is this in blue here. Okay. And remember I said this S factor, we just assume is constant. So we pull that outside the the integral here. And because these are both exponents, I, I, I can just bring them both in the same, same uh, exponent there, okay? So you already told me that as the speed increases, the cross section gets bigger. But as the speed increases, the, the, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution gets smaller. The probability that you have a particle at that velocity is less, right? So you have these two effects going against each other. You have the cross section getting bigger with speed, but the, the probability getting smaller with speed. And so we multiply both of those together. And let me show you a graph here. And you can, you can make, well, you can tell I made this with Excel. You can make this with Excel really easily. Um, uh, it's a logarithmic plot. You can see the numbers are, are kind of tiny on the left-hand side. Um, 
but what this is, is, is the red is the cross section. Okay, the, the blue is, is the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution and you have to multiply them together. Okay. Now, in astrophysics, uh, if I have some, oops, if I have some temperature here, um, uh, I can't remember what the temperature was here. I think it was 1 billion Kelvin. Um, if I have some temperature, the product of these two is this yellow line. And you can see that it, it peaks at some energy. Okay. Now, usually in astrophysics, we think of temperatures of 100 million Kelvin, 1 billion Kelvin. Those sound really, really big, right? But you have to multiply them by the Boltzmann constant, which is really tiny. And so the probability that you actually have nuclei that are moving really fast is small. And so the overlap of these two is actually really small. On a linear plot, in fact, you, you wouldn't even see this, this yellow line. It would look flat because it's you know, a, a one, two orders of magnitude less than some of these other ones here. And, and so this is, this is what makes astrophysics hard a lot of times is sometimes the rates can be really small, but what we do is we do this trick to know, to know where, where the rates peak, what energies are important here. So if I look at this plot here, do, do I care about nuclei with energies of, of 5 MeV? Yeah. No, no, it would be way down here, right? It's, it's so many orders of magnitude less, right? And I, I probably don't care about nuclei with um, 0.01 MeV or 10 keV because it drops quite a bit. So really, I only care about these. Um, take a look at the shape of the rates here. Do you think we can approximate this shape to a, to a well-known function? That one uh, looks like a logarithm. Just for the just for the yellow one, yeah. Just for the yellow one, yeah. But still a logarithm. It's still a log plot. Yep. Okay, so you have to in your head think about what it might look like on a linear plot. Yeah. On a linear plot, really, the the most important part would be the the top of it, right? Or a log plot, the most important part would be the top, right? because the rest of it is so many orders of magnitude less. Can we approximate that to something, do you think? It's hard to see it from a log plot. It is. So let me put it on a linear plot for you. Yes. On a linear plot, it would look something yeah. like this. Yeah, it looks like a Gaussian, right? It looks, yeah, and this is what we do all the time in astrophysics, because then it makes the calculations very easy. Computers calculate Gaussians very easily. There's all kinds of libraries out there that you can get. Okay, um, and, and, and your, your, your integrand, integrating over this becomes a lot easier. By the way, this is important. This, this region where the rates are at a maximum is called the gamma off window after the astrophysicist who thought about that. Okay, so absolutely we can approximate that to a Gaussian. Um, by the way, there are a couple other theoretical calculations here. Yes, question. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, this was a, a figure that I did for a, a paper a while ago. Uh, we're not going to talk about it. I might might talk about it next week. I might give a seminar on it next week. Um, in a plasma, you have ions, you have nuclei, right? But you also have electrons floating around, right? All, all these electrons. Those actually make the charges look less. And that's what screening means. So if it's screened, it means there's a bunch, I'm looking at a nucleus over there and there's a bunch of electrons in the way and the, the charge looks less and it can increase the rate. So these, these are just different calculations with different. Um, that's also an approximation for screening with where the electrons are very relativistic. DH, if, if you're interested, means uh, Debye-Huckel. Um, it's an approximation for screening. Yep, it's a linear approximation for the electron screening potential. Yep. Uh, if you're interested, I can show you a paper or two that, that we wrote on this. It's, it's kind of a fun project, um, th this right here. So. And so we, we approximate this to a Gaussian. And if you like, if you like to look at the math, you can, you can follow the math on the left-hand side. Um, there's our Gaussian function. We can figure out the centroid where it's a maximum. 
we can figure out the width where, where, by taking a second derivative, but, but um, uh, really all you need to know is, is, is this is how you figure out the, the centroid. Um, B is from a previous slide, and th this is how you figure out, figure out the, the, the width of, of the Gaussian if you want. Um, and you compare the two on the right side, it, it, it's it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not not perfect, but it's not bad. It, it can get better in many cases, especially at some higher temperatures, but not bad. And if you integrate over both of these, which is what we end up doing eventually, um, you'll get very very similar answers for the rates. And we do this all the time. Um, if you are very if you are interested in very 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 precise rates, um, it probably won't work. But on the other hand. Uh, many times in astrophysics, um, even if we know something to within an order of magnitude, we're happy. Okay. We can be very sloppy in astrophysics most of the time. Questions so far? Okay. All right. So we've learned all the nuclear physics that we need to learn to go on. Now we're going to do the fun things. Um, We've gone over some basics. And by the way, if you understand everything up until now, you're doing really well because usually um, people don't learn this stuff until they get to be in graduate school. And so if you understand some of it, you're doing very, very well. Um, sometimes it's difficult to, to assimilate all of it. Um, we've learned the nuclear physics because we're, we're convinced that we have to know nuclear physics to deal with stars and interstellar objects. Now we want to uh, apply our knowledge of nuclear physics to some, some uh, elements of astronomy, um, and especially what we call nucleosynthesis, how the elements are made. So we're going to start at the very beginning. Um, we're going to start at the beginning of the universe, in fact. Uh, we'll start at the, the Big Bang. So slight shift now in, in our thinking, slight change in the lectures now, but let's take a look at this. Um, and, and first of all, talk about a little bit about cosmology, okay? So when we look at stellar spectra, uh, you've probably seen, in fact, I think there's a picture out in the hallway, uh, you've probably seen that uh, stellar spectra look like, look like this down here. And they have those dark lines in them, okay? Where do those dark lines come from? Yeah, I'm not sure. Say that again. Elements. The elements, yeah, absorption, yeah, absorption, right? Yeah. Also for the expansion of the universe. Uh, the yeah. Yep. The yeah, exactly. From... Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And so we can see these dark lines and we know exactly what the pattern is, for example, for, for hydrogen. Hydrogen is shown here. We know exactly what that pattern looks like. And if, if those lines are shifted, if they're squished in one direction, Right, right, yeah, that means it's moving away. If they're stretched out, it's blue shifted, then then something's moving towards us. It's the Doppler shift. By the way, you have experience with the Doppler shift every day, especially yeah, living near the highway here. Yeah. You, you, we hear the Doppler shift every day. Okay? <laughs> Interestingly, sirens have two Doppler shifts, right? Because you have the frequency of the sound, but then it gets louder and quieter. That's Doppler shifted as well. So, so Edwin Hubble spent a lot of time looking at the Doppler shifts of spectra for many galaxies. And what he found was, was very interesting. It changed cosmology forever. This was in about 1929, I believe, early 1900s. He found that galaxies that are farther away are moving faster. Galaxies that are closer are moving not so fast. So all the galaxies are moving away from us, but the ones that are farther away are moving faster. So what does that tell you? The universe is expanding, yeah. yeah the universe is expanding. Something that's farther away is moving faster. Now you may think the universe is expanding in every direction from us. You may think we're at the center of the universe. Yes. It's not just the, it's not just the universe. It's the, the space time that is also expanding. Yeah, yep. Space time is expanding, and that's 
really what what we think about when we think about the redshift, right? Because you're, you're stretching out, stretching out space and time. You're stretching out light. Exactly. So if the universe is expanding, space time is expanding, and it's going in all directions, you may think, well, we're we're at the center, right? Because everything is moving away from us. But that's not necessarily true. And a good example is very simple example here, but but. T t take a look at this. This is this is a loaf of bread with with raisins in it. Okay. As this loaf of bread expands, okay, any raisin anywhere inside the loaf of bread is going to see every other raisin moving away from it, right? And the farther away the raisins are, the faster it moves. Okay. Uh, but, but by the by the way, I don't know if you you probably know raisins are dried grapes. I only drink grapes here in Sicily. I never, never eat raisins. So. The farther away it is, the faster it moves. So you don't have to be at the center of the universe. However, what we think of as the universe is how far out we can see in every direction. The observable universe, absolutely right, okay? And so Edwin Hubble determined that if an object is one megaparsec away, one million parsecs, 3.26 million light years, it's moving at 71 kilometers per second. That's, that's pretty fast, but that's also a pretty precise measurement. That's pretty amazing what he was able to do. Um, over one, three, three, three million light years, he's able to determine speeds fairly accurately. Question? Yeah, is this increasing speed um, directly proportional to the square of the uh, distance? Uh, directly proportional to the distance. No, not the square. Okay. Not the square. Linear. Yep. It's a linear relationship. Yep. Um, not quite, but I'll get into that in a second. Okay. Yep, question. Uh, the the parsec is a measure of distance, right? Measure of distance. Uh, what does it stand for? 3.26 light years. So yes, why, why do we use the parsec? Yeah, it's, I think it's mostly historical. Um, I'll talk about how we determine distances in a minute. It relates to how we determine distances. A light year seems convenient, right? I mean, we understand it. A parsec is, is historical. And I'll, I'll talk about that. Yep. Question? Oh, okay. I mean, the question was why. Why picking a measure that's exactly 3.26 light years when we could just use the light just, years. Like, just say light years, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. It's it's, it, and I always have to look this number up, by the way, because the astronomers they know this and they always say parsecs. It's it's like they say x, y, and z. It means different than what we say x, y, and z. Um, I like to think in light years because it makes sense to me, but. Um, we'll talk about it. It really is a historical measurement why we why we do that. So, homework question for you: Can you determine the size and age of the observable universe? Okay, so think about that. See if you can do that when you go home. Yeah. Oh, I don't remember. I always have to calculate it without reading it. Yeah, with, without <laughs> memorizing it. Can you? Amount of uh, uh, the years of the universe times the speed of light. It, it, it's even more fundamental than that. So, question is, isn't it the age of the universe times the speed of light? K kind of, yes, true. But think about um, what we call causality. If if I take a laser and I shine it at you, those photons are traveling at the speed of light, right? Okay. Um, now, if I'm in another galaxy and I'm shining this laser at you, my galaxy is moving away at a certain speed, right? And those photons are still moving at the speed of light, but they're red shifted, okay? Um, how far can I be before you never see my laser, okay? We call that causal contact. And this is really interesting because something that we see on the edge of the universe may be in causal contact with something in space-time that we will never see. Of course, if somebody in another space-time 
is in causal contact with them and they send them a message, they'll never send us a message because it's just like someone way outside our universe trying to send a message. So causality is a big effect here in cosmology. Okay. So this calculation isn't exact. It's just theoretical because it, it is possible to see uh, the past of our universe, but we are not certain that we are in fact in this portion of the universe. Yeah, I, I'll talk a little bit about looking into the past. Um, uh, um, the, yeah, theoretically, I think linearly, if the universe really is expanding linearly, this would be exact. But I'll talk a little more about the expansion in a second here. Okay. Okay. Um, so I've seen this figure several times on the campus here. It's outside on the wall. It's in the wall in the hallway here. This is just a, a, a kind of a fun representation of the Big Bang. Um, uh, Big Bang, by the way, is a uh, sort of a bad way to call it. It's 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 like saying imaginary numbers. Um, imagine, I, I hate the term imaginary numbers because it's not like we just made them up out of our head. They're real mathematical tools. Big Bang, it, it wasn't really like an explosion. There might've been some quantum fluctuation or something like that. What precisely happened is still uh, um, subject to, to debate, but um, the very initial formation of the universe um, was some quantum effect, okay? And it was probably like a, a phase transition. Okay, there's a lot of popular books out there about it. What we're particularly interested in is what happened after the initial inflationary period. So, so that idea of inflation was was postulated, um, I believe, in my own lifetime, because the uh, um, apparent age of the universe did not match what we know about thermodynamics, and that was a serious problem. What causes that is a very, um, uh, uh, very difficult topic, okay? But we're gonna talk about this period here. We're gonna talk about the history of the universe after all of the quarks were formed, okay? And, and we're gonna talk about the temperature of the universe. We're going to talk about uh, um, uh, how old the universe was at various times, and then we'll talk about how the elements evolved in that time, okay? So somebody asked about, is the universe expanding linearly? The 2009, I believe, 2009 Nobel Prize um, was uh, won by Paul Sir, um, Saul Perlmutter, uh, Brian Schmidt, and Adam Rice uh, for, for determining that the universe is actually accelerating. Um, there's some sort of dark energy, what we call dark energy in the universe, that's causing it to accelerate, okay? And, and we're kind of at the point in the history of the universe where we're able to observe that. Uh, um, the, the acceleration compared to the linear growth is, is fairly small but it still is an acceleration. Um, and the way they did that was, was they looked at the redshift from, from various objects far away. So let me um, sh show you how we determine distances, okay? Um, th this is called the cosmic ladder. And the reason it's called the cosmic ladder because uh, let, let's say I wanted to measure my distance from me um, to, to, to you. Okay, I, I could get some kind of tape measure, right? I, I probably would not use a microscope to measure the distance because you know microscopes are you know measured by micro, and I probably would not use um, a telescope to measure that distance. I would just use an ordinary tape measure, and this is what the cosmic ladder is: is it's different tools to measure different distances. So we can use radar to determine the distance to the moon. Uh, I believe we can use radar to see Venus and Mars, um, but, but not very far at all. Generally, uh, we've successfully used radar to see things within our own solar system, okay, including the comet cloud surrounding it. Um, after that, we use parallax. Does anyone know what parallax is? It's not parallax, like when you close your eyes. 
That's exactly it. Yep, that's exactly it. Yep, yep. I, I believe we use the, the two um, for the start eight, eight axis of the, uh, of the revolution of the Earth. Yep, right? Yep, that's exactly it. Yep. As the Earth is orbiting the Sun, as the Earth is orbiting the Sun, so we have the Sun and then the, the Earth orbiting it. Um, if we see a star somewhere out here, it may appear in one direction, and then on the other side of the orbit, it may appear in the other direction. That that's parallel, okay, and it's exactly that thing where you do with your thumb. Uh, it's how we as humans are able to tell if something is moving, right? Um, e even even against a a, a a blank sky, okay. Um, so getting into the history. Um, how accurately can we measure it? Well, we can see things about 100 light years away. We measure this, this angle. Okay. Um, and here's why you were at, here's the, the origin of parsec. When, th when this angle is equal to one, one second, one second, okay, one um, 3600th of a degree, um, something will be one parsec away. And, and what that means is parallel second of arc. That makes sense. Yeah. Par sec. Um, this is like the only astronomy fact I know. Because if it was really just from uh, conversion of the light here, it would be kind of a janky number like that. Yeah, yeah, something arbitrary, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, question in back? Nope. Okay. So one uh, second is. I'm sorry. Uh, one second is. Oh, what, what's one second? So, um, uh, let's see. One, one degree is equal to sixty minutes. This means minutes. Um, one minute is equal to sixty seconds. Okay, so so 60, 3,600, 3,600 seconds in, in one, one degree. Yep. Okay, um, and then to see things even farther out, we use Cepheid variables. These are stars whose, whose magnitude relates to their pulsation frequency. They pulsate, and so we see them pulsating, and then we know what their magnitude is, and then we can determine how far away they are based on their, their, their apparent magnitude. Okay, it's like looking at a light bulb um, far away. And then super, supernova 1A, uh, type 1A supernova. This is what won the Nobel Prize for Brian Schmidt. But I'm, by the way, I met him a couple of years ago. He's a really neat person. He, um, he lives in Australia now. He took his Nobel Prize and he bought a, a, uh, he bought a vineyard. Which, which I think is a great way to spread it. Yeah. Brian Schmidt. Um, what, what did he buy? He bought a vineyard, a, a winery. Vineyard. Yeah. In Australia? In Australia, yeah. He should have bought one in Sicily, but uh, you know, that, that's all right. Yeah. And, and so th then after that, we can use redshift. And, and once you start to get up to 10 billion light years, things are very, very, very redshifted very compressed to one side of the spectrum. All right, now let's talk a little bit about temperature in the Big Bang. Talk a little bit about temperature. Um, oh, here's, here's by the way, just, just um, this was the figure from uh, that Nobel Prize winning paper. Um, these are, this is the, the, basically the magnitude of a type 1A supernova. See, see, we know what the magnitudes are pretty well. We can predict those very, very well. This is the magnitude versus the, the distance, which really means the speed versus the distance. Um, if Hubble's law were to hold, it, it would um, be a perfect line, okay? But, well, they found it, it deviates just, just, a, just a little bit from a perfect line. Uh, as the universe ages, we'll see that deviation more and more because the universe is accelerating, we'll see them traveling faster the farther they are. So 
um, for those of you who are going to be around in, in, in 10 billion years or so, you can look at this and see how it has changed. So you'll let me know. Yeah, I'll probably be dead because I'm older than you all. But um, but that that uh, just, just fantastic work just because I did good data analysis on it. We really, really worked hard on that. <clears throat> All right, now, now temperature is, is very important in the Big Bang. So if I have a universe and there's photons in that universe, okay? Those photons are, are being stretched out. As they're being red shifted as the universe expands. Okay, Photons farther away are red shifted more because the universe is moving away from us farther at those points away. What's happening to the matter density in the universe? Decreases, right? Of course, right? I, I have a box of marbles and I make the box bigger and bigger. What happens to the energy density of the universe? Also decreases, right? It decreases. Now, when we think of energy density, we think of things like temperature. So as the universe is expanding, it gets colder. It gets colder. Does anyone remember what the temperature of the universe is roughly right now? And minus two seventy Kelvin. Yeah, to two point seven three Kelvin. Yep. 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 Yeah. And if you want to convert to centigrade, yeah. Um, don't convert to Fahrenheit. That's a terrible <laughs> system. Maintenance. I don't know why we still use it. It's crazy. So um, this is a difficult figure for you to read, probably. But on the left hand side is some times as well as some major events in the universe. Yep. What's the difference between um, a hadron and a boson, a baryon? Uh, um, what, what's the hadron? What's a hadron? A hadron is anything that's made of quarks. So a proton and a neutron is a hadron. Um, Do you get the same thing as a baryon? Uh, yes, baryons are hadrons. Yep, all baryons are hadrons. There are hadrons which are not baryons. Um, mesons, for example, are, are would be a quark anti quark pair. So, yep, yep, good question. Yep, so yeah, hadrons are made of quarks, absolutely. So the universe is cooling. Um, there's some interesting things I want to note in this figure, and it is kind of small, but um, very early on, we're not quite sure what the physics was. You might have heard about grand unification theories. This was the idea that things were so hot that all the forces just looked the same, yeah. okay? Um, and, and this is a result of particle physics. Yeah, um, at some point we had a quark hadron transition and I'll talk about what all that means. Then we had nuclear synthesis, nucleosynthesis. So at some point all the quarks formed, um, but they were, were bare quarks. They, they, they were floating around. Um, at another point, the universe cooled enough so that nuclei could survive. Then the universe cooled some more and atoms could be made. Then it cooled some more and we could make molecules. Okay. Now, th that shows all these things here. Recombination is, is another one of those bad words that, that confuse people. Uh, recombination indicates that at one point things were already combined and then they uncombined and then they recombined. Um, they were never combined. They just combined the first time. And what we talk about when we say recombination, we mean the point in history when, when atoms were made when a nucleus could hold on to an electron, okay? That was really, really interesting. Yep. Uh, was there a point in time, as we think, where um, quarks were wandering alone? Or... Oh yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that too. That was way back here, what we called the quark hadron, right before the quark hadron transition. Because, uh, I heard that uh, we can not observe Particles which are, which are uh, uh, color, uh, color neutral charge. Right, right. So, 
Yeah, yeah. So the question is, what was there a time when there were free quarks very early in the universe? Uh, you, right, right. Yep. You probably heard the term quark gluon plasma. Um, we can produce a quark gluon plasma in the laboratory. How do we do that? We smash protons together extremely fast so that it becomes very dense, very hot. Okay. Um, let's take a look at, yep, question? Yeah, how, how do we know all of this? Did we theorize uh, those things or we are able to prove some of it? Oh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Question is, how do we know all this? Um, is it theoretical or did we pr prove some of it? Um, um, let's talk about, in answer to that question, let me talk about this point in time right here, recombination. At that point in time, the universe was cool enough so that electrons could be captured onto atoms. Okay. Before that, all we had were a bunch of nuclei and a bunch of free electrons floating around. Okay. Now, the universe was very hot, but it was very dark. Do you know why? Because well, light, there, there was no light. It, 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 it uh, interacting with matter. Yeah, it, uh, there, there was plenty of light because it was very hot, right? Um, Planck's law still worked back then. But because of all the charges, light likes to interact with electrons, likes to interact with charged particles quite a bit. And so, light would travel a very short distance before it was recaptured, okay? After the electrons were captured onto atoms, all of a sudden, that interaction of light went down tremendously and the photons were able to freely stream. We see that today. Cosmic microwave background, yep. When we look out to the edge of the universe, the farthest we can see is this point where is this point where the photons became what we call free streaming, where the photons were able to, 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 to go in all directions unhindered. Okay. So in answer to your question, we can easily see everything after recombination. Before recombination, it, it, it's um, um, a result of calculation. At least we can't see what happened, but we can detect it. And I'll talk about some of the tools we have to be able to detect it. Okay. Yep. If we were able to create a solid temperature, we could have known how was the universe before the temperature. Yes. Yeah. Great question. If we could create a very high temperature, could we s simulate the universe? Yeah. Um, CERN does this quite a bit um, with their proton collider. They create a, a quark gluon plasma, which might have been um, what the early universe was. A bunch of deconfined quarks, a bunch of quarks that are able to move around freely. Of course, it only lives for a, a very short time, but they're able to see um, um, uh, the particles coming out of that quark gluon plasma. At what time uh, we arrived? Uh... At what time did humans arrive? Uh, humans arrived way humans arrived at this very last sliver humans aren't very old and, um, and uh, by this consideration so oh what uh, time we what time we arrived uh, oh oh for the quark gluon plasma is, is that what you're asking yeah the quark gluon plasma was in 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 this area here uh, generally this area so, so everything from say 10 to the minus 30 to one microsecond oh. Yep, question? Uh, I, I don't get if, uh, if I'm wrong, if I get this wrong, but um, are we able to observe um, a single quarks? Uh, Deconfined quarks? Uh, yeah, you can't, they, they don't live for very long. They have a very, very short half life. They exist. I, I knew uh, you cannot have a. Uh, um, uh, quark uh, traveling in the space alone, but it, ha it has to be accompanied by uh, other two quarks or an anti-quark. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah, that is correct. Okay. 
And, and so in the laboratory, what we do is when we do our uh, nuclear collisions, they're fast enough so that they can break those bonds because two quarks are held together with very tight, yeah, very tight it's binding it's energy. The same energy as uh, needs to create uh, an anti-quark. Anti exactly. Right? Yep. Yep. Okay. So I, I, I did get this right. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. And, and they, they don't live very long because they'll find another quark to attach to, or they, they could decay into some other things. And that's what we really see. Okay. Yeah, that's a, it's really neat. Question over here? Yeah. Yep. For, forgive me if I'm skeptical, but about this question. <laughs> How uh, we are not certain if um, uh, about creating um, about the fact that creating enough uh, it will reproduce the, the same effect that happened in the, in the early age of the universe. I mean, th there was a, a very little space time at that time, so everything was co everything was hot, but everything was also very compressed in a little space. It, I don't think we are able to, re to reproduce that kind of, uh, at least for now, that kind of uh, situation. Yeah, we, we can't reproduce, I, I, I think, at least right now, we don't have the technology to, to reproduce the very first 10 to the minus 30 seconds. I think that's very speculative right now. So um, we can't reproduce what we call the inflationary phase in the laboratory. Absolutely, we cannot do that. So yeah. I, is, is that re uh, re relevant? Is it, it's, very, it's very relevant because we're not sure how that, um, we're not sure if, if all of the forces were a single force at one point. So, it, it, and it's, it's really a hot topic these days as well. It brings into things like string theory, grand unification theories, um, highly speculative. Um, I'm, I'm going to confess, I don't know a whole lot about grand unification theory, but it, it's, you're absolutely right. Um, we can produce up to, say, the quark gluon plasma, but we can't reproduce before that. Yep. Other questions? Okay. So, um, as ter in terms of photons, we can we see the light from recombination, so we can see as far back as to recombination. That gives us a lot of hints as to what happened before then. But we can also see what happened before then, because prior to recombination was, was nucleosynthesis. This is where the atomic nuclei were formed in the universe. This is where we had things like hydrogen and helium. And we can, uh, um, we can look out into space. We can look at stellar spectra, galactic spectra. And we can get an idea of how much of this was formed. We can look back at uh, uh, um, galaxies, um, Quasars really far away. We're looking back in time, and we can see what their spectra look like. We can determine what's in them. So we can see nucleosynthesis. We can at least see what it was at certain points in time, and that helps us out a little bit. Okay, and all of these are different tools. Okay, let's talk about temperature. So, if I want, if I have a molecule, um, let's say I have DNA. And I want to break that molecule up into atoms. What would I do? Yeah. Heat it up. Yep. That's in fact that's exactly how they do it. It's called denaturing the molecule. If I have an atom, and I want to strip all the electrons off that atom, what should I do? You just kick it. Kick it. Just kick it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, to increase the energy of the electron. Yeah. Increase, increase the energy of the electrons. Yeah. Yeah. Still heating it up will work. Yeah. Like still heat it up, right? Energy. Yep. Smashing two atoms together. Yep. Yep. Just somehow giving it energy, right? Okay. If I have if I have a nucleus and I want to break that nucleus up into more pieces, energy. more energy. I can heat it up. In fact, stars do that. Supernova do that. They get so hot that they break nuclei up. If I have a proton and I want to break it up into its quarks, what should I do? Heat it up. Yeah, yeah. It's all, it's all heat. It's all heat. Because what is heat? What is temperature? Really, it's just what the photon frequencies are. When we talk about temperature, we just mean how many photons are out there and what their frequency is. And that's how we think about the temperature of the universe. And so the right-hand side here, the right-hand side shows very roughly, very, very roughly, and we're, we're going to do this in much more detail, but very roughly, 
the temperature of the universe as a function of its age, as well as the, the points at which various things happen. Okay. See, see the slide? Earliest time we can see that, okay. that that's when atoms were made. Right. That, that's as far back as we can see optically. Okay. If we were to look at nuclear abundances, we can see back to when nuclei were made. Yeah. And so, so temperature versus that. Keep this in mind, because this is particularly interesting. Okay, uh, I have been talking for an hour. I can usually listen to myself talk for an hour before I put myself to sleep. <laughs> um, we will take maybe a five minute break so we can go to the bathroom or have a drink of water or something like that, okay? okay. So five minutes and we will come back. Sì, ma la registrazione le carica da qualche parte? Sì, sì. 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 S
get sent on, let's say, a page of the flight or somewhere else. Oh, uh, we can we can put it there if you like. If you're talking about the Teams recording, yeah, 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 we can put it there. Oh, yeah. 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 I know, I know, Doc, uh, Professor Kirby is recording me, so we can do that. So we, so, yeah. But, yes, uh, yes uh, being recorded. Yes, yeah, he's recording today as well. Oh, okay. yeah. Actually, the team is set up so that as soon as we get into it, it starts recording. Okay, we will give one minute for people to come back. And, uh, and restart. Nel frattempo, professore Carubini, eh, se, se, eh, se mi poteva dire come prendere la presenza, perché non so se l'ha detto, perché mi sono collegato leggermente più tardi. No, dicevo di mandare come ieri un messaggio con nome, cognome, matricola e, e, e basta, presente, con scritto presente, come abbiamo fatto ieri. No, sì, io ero collegato, eh, ieri ero in classe, quindi per questo. Sì, sì, no, no, solo così. L'avevo messo nella chat di ieri, forse non la guardate. Se aprite la chat di Teams, ci sono un po' di commenti. Va bene, grazie. Prego. Okay, well, I've had five minutes here, so I guess we can start up again. Um, probably people will come back as, as we continue talking here. So, so what, have, what have we learned so far? Um, as the universe expands, it's getting colder. That's, that's really what you want to remember. Uh, um, and as the universe gets cooler and cooler, things are able to survive because it's cold enough for them to survive. There's not so many photons flying around that they are being destroyed. Um, in the universe, we think of a couple different things. We think of the, the matter density, which is pretty easy to see. We can, we can see where, where the matter, well, we can, we can tell where the matter is. We may not be able to see it um, because we know how gravity works. And we also think of the energy density, both of which are decreasing. And the energy density we think of as, as the, the photons in the universe the light that is traveling through the universe. Um, it turns out that they do not decrease at the same rate. The radiation density is decreasing at a different rate than the matter density. So let me show you this figure here. Um, on the left-hand side, actually um, right-hand side, uh, I, I'm not going to derive these. Um, they're not too difficult to derive, but um, they're also in, in the very first chapter of any cosmology book. Um, <clears throat> something called the equation of state is what is the pressure density relationship of the universe? So if we know how the universe is expanding, we have a, a, a time relationship. We also know what the density is. So in a radiation dominated universe, if the universe were nothing but photons, we get this, this first relationship here. We see that the, the temperature, the square of the temperature is inversely proportional to the time. Okay. Again, not deriving it. Um, uh, if you want the derivation, you can definitely look it up, but um, it's, it's not too tricky. In a matter dominated universe, the, the temperature is inversely proportional to the time. So, so there are some slight differences there. So if the universe had no photons, but only, only baryons, that's what it would look like. Of course, it has both. 
And if we, we look at that, if we look at the energy density, you can think of this as the energy density um, or mass density, mass and energy are the same thing. And, and the time since the Big Bang down here, you can plot, you can plot the, the, the energy density um, and the, uh, excuse me, the matter density in this red line and the radiation density in this blue line. You can plot them independently. Now, now at some point, at some point, they're going to be equal. So before that point, we say the universe is radiation dominated because there's more radiation energy density than there's matter. So we say, yep, universe is radiation dominated. After that point, we say the universe is, is matter dominated. Now this is actually kind of interesting here. Um, dark energy, the, the, this is what won the Nobel prize uh, that I mentioned uh, uh, several minutes ago. The, the, there is something that is causing the universe to accelerate. We call it dark energy. We don't know what it is. At least I don't. Not yet. Excuse me. Um, yep. Say that again. How can dark energy density be the same if the universe is expanding? Oh, how can the dark energy density be the same? Um, we don't know a lot about dark energy. Um, we don't even know if it's constant there. We just wrote it in because we know it, it, it's something but we're not sure. All we know is that it exists at this point. Um, um, you might have heard of the Einstein equations uh, where he talked about things like the expansion of the universe and he put a term in his equation which was the cosmological constant. He called it the biggest mistake of his life. It turns out it was real and, and we discovered that it's real. That being said, we don't know what it is. We're not sure what's causing it. We know that the universe is accelerating. So, so, so that line is really kind of a cartoon, if you will. Yeah. It's really interesting, though, because we're living in this era right now where, where, where we're starting to see the effects of this line. You know, the universe is old enough that, that we can start to see the, the dark energy density showing itself, assuming, assuming that it looks like that. It may, it may not. Okay. So anyway, keep these in mind, the temperature time relationships, okay? Um, and then t take a look at this table. So I asked you a few minutes ago, um, how, do we, how do we break apart atoms? We, we heat them up. How do we break apart nuclei? We heat them up. How do we break apart pro protons? We heat them up. So we can make a rough table and, and, and this isn't too difficult at all, but we can look at various events in the universe. So, for example, during this event here, this is called the strong electroweak decoupling. During this first event, that's, that's when quarks formed. That's when quarks were able to move around freely. Okay. Well, well, what temperature do we have to have before a quark can form? So the heaviest quark is, is, is the top quark. And so if we take that, that would have to be a high temperature. We take the mass energy of a top quark, which here is 170,000 MeV, and we can figure out the, the temperature, Kt. So we just say, what temperature do we need to get to break apart a top quark? So we say K times the temperature is kind of equal to the mass of the top quark. If the temperature is higher than, 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 than this, if Kt is higher than this, then, then a top quark can't survive. Does that make sense? So this is the temperature at which we get a top quark. Okay? This was probably, probably in the inflationary period or maybe just past the inflationary period. At that point, things were very, very hot. So it might have been just around the inflationary period. Now, after the quarks formed, we have this event called electromagnetic weak decoupling, or, or sometimes electroweak decoupling. That was the point at which, which leptons could form. Okay, leptons are electrons, muons, and, and taus. The most massive lepton is, is, 
1,800 MeV right there. Well, what temperature do we need to break that mass up? What temperature do we need to, to break apart a lepton? Um, roughly temperature of about two tenths into the 13 Kelvin, huge temperatures, huge, trillions of Kelvin. Okay, things were still pretty bizarre at that point. Maybe, maybe near the end of inflation, maybe just a little after the inflationary period. Yep. What, uh, what order of magnitude does the CERN uh, produce? Oh yeah, good question. The question is what order of magnitude does CERN do? Yeah, yeah CERN will go, um, CERN will go way up here. CERN has energies of, of TeV, trillion electron volts. Um, trillion, so, so, so trillion electron volts is a, is a, uh, a million, million electron volts, I think. So even one order of magnitude more than this, and, and probably even a little higher, I think. Yep. So they, uh, they found Uh, but yeah, yeah, and that's what they're working on. They're working on that decoupling there. Yep. Yep, that, that's what's called the quark gluon plasma here. Okay, then the universe cooled some more, and it cooled enough so that nucleons, baryons, could be made. Okay, so this binding force of nucleons, it was cold enough so that the KT, the energy temperature of the universe, was less than the... Uh, binding energy of a nucleon. That was the quark hadron transition. Um, at that point, the universe was, was radiation dominated. There, there were um, um, mostly photons in terms of energy of the universe. Okay. And then the universe cooled enough so that those nucleons could come together and form nuclei. So KT was less than the binding energy of. of a nucleus. So you remember a couple of days ago, a nuclear binding energy is something like MeV, maybe 10 MeV or something like that. And so here um, I just wrote down, I, I just wrote down the binding energy of a deuteron. Uh, hydrogen two, neutron and proton stuck together. Simplest nucleus we can make has a binding energy of 2.2 MeV. Um, a temperature to break that up would, would be somewhere around 2.5, 2.5, 25 billion Kelvin. Oh, B Big Bang Nucleosynthesis, Big Bang Nucleosynthesis, BBN. Uh, that's when we started to make nuclei. Okay. Sorry, yep. can you repeat what is uh, K? Oh, 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 yeah, K is, K is Boltzmann's constant. Oh. Yeah. So it's a thermodynamics, right? You probably saw for an ideal gas, uh, three halves KT, you probably see, have seen that. And so, of course, in, in astrophysics, you know, we, we, we don't care so much about numbers like three halves because, you know, you know we, if, if we're close to within a factor of 10, we're pretty happy. Um, so, so usually we'll just say something like KT is somewhere along, say, the energy that we're interested in. Yeah. Say, uh, Boltzmann's constant. By the way, does anyone know what Boltzmann's constant is? Yeah, you know, the, the only number I, I remember is um is is uh zero point zero eight six one seven three three um M E V per one billion Kelvin. This is a convenient number to remember because it uh um we work in MEV in astrophysics and we use billions of Kelvin in astrophysics, so it makes it so and, and if, if you're really in a hurry, you can just say Point one. Right. Very easy. Yep. Okay. Oh, and by the way, um, th these numbers are just numbers that I put in. It's, it's sort of an approximation for when these things might have happened. Uh, certainly, you could have said, well, how about the temperature at which helium formed, for example? Or, or how about the temperature at which a proton was made, for example? Okay. Um, then the universe cooled more and atoms were made. And so for that energy, I figured use, use the ionization energy of hydrogen. How, how much energy does it take to strip an electron off of hydrogen? Um, uh, very small, 13 keV, 13.1 keV. What, what, probably heard one Rydberg. Um, 
Uh, now we're down in temperatures, temperatures that you'll see in stars. So, so 15,000 Kelvin, uh, several tens of thousands of Kelvin or so. And, and then, oh, and, and this was the point, remember, this is the point where the universe went from radiation dominated to matter dominated because all those electrons effectively went away. They went into atoms. And so this is the point where, where the radiation density was equal to that matter density. So that, that's a special point right there. Okay. And, and then uh, um, molecules formed. And so so uh, for a molecule, I said the, the, the hydrogen bond, uh, how big is the hydrogen bond between two hydrogen atoms? Very small electron volts, a couple electron volts, but very, very low temperature. And then our, we're, we're in the present here, okay? We're in the present where we know the, the temperature of the cosmic microwave background is 2.73 Kelvin. So it's a very, very cold universe. It's going to continue to get colder. Okay? So bring a winter jacket, right? Um, okay, you, you notice I didn't, I didn't put times in here. I didn't put times, but I have given you, I have given you the tools to, to calculate those times. Okay, they, they're in your notes. So, so the exam question for you is, is calculate the size and age of the observable universe, which I gave you earlier. Use this information to compute the times in the previous table. So see if you're able to, to do that. that you, could, you could take that home and work on that. Um, you have all the tools. There's one tricky thing you got to remember there. I'm not going to tell you what you have to remember, but I think you know what it is, okay? All right, so let's talk about Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Let's talk about the stage in the universe when the protons and neutrons were formed. Let's talk about the stage after that when those protons and neutrons came together and they became the nuclei that we see today. Okay, so the protons and neutrons are already made. By that point, the universe had cooled to a few billion degrees Kelvin. It depends heavily on two things. Um, first of all, it depends on the neutron to proton ratio. Okay. If I have, if I have all protons in the universe, I, 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 I probably can't make helium very easily. If, if I have all neutrons in the universe, then it's really weird. Okay. Um, and so, so this affects, remember we talked about the nuclear reaction network yesterday, the neutron to proton ratio, it, it's the abundance, right? Those, those ends in the thermonuclear reaction rate, it affects the, the nuclear reaction network. And we get this from cosmic abundances. We're able to look at stars and galaxies and we're able to see what the elements are in them and then add up all the protons and neutrons, okay? It also, um, this, this should be here, um, this should be, oh no, this is right. Nucleosynthesis also depends on what we call the, the photon to, to baryon ratio or the baryon to photon ratio, whichever you want. Um, how many photons were there when nucleosynthesis started? How many baryons were there when nucleosynthesis started? And, and we get that. Any ideas where we might get that information from? Oh, I already told you. Sorry. We, we get it from the cosmic microwave background. So we look out into space. We see what the universe looks like. We're able to extrapolate backwards and determine the temperature and then determine the number of photons. Okay? And that helps give us the temperature for our nuclear reaction networks because remember, temperature tells you how fast things are moving. Temperature gives you that, that gamma off window that we were talking about, okay? Let me just show you a little bit of math. Uh, again, not necessary to understand this heavily, but it is kind of interesting to think about. But first of all, let me ask you, um, what do you know about neutrons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. roughly, and, and why do you say roughly? Because uh, they are sorted by uh, um, two upwards, one downwards, and 
Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, something, something. They're made of quarks, right? And uh, the output and the output are in the big sets and plus. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, ne neutrons are a little heavier than protons. A little heavier. Um, neutron mass is... Uh, um, so, so, so the mass of a neutron is... Uh, check me on this because I might be wrong. Um, double check, but I'm pretty sure it's around 939.5 MeV, I think. Okay, double check. I, I, I might be wrong. The mass of a proton, if I remember correctly, is around 931, around 931 MeV. Um, again, check. But the point is that a neutron is heavier than a proton. Um, that means when the universe is cooling, which, 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 which nucleus is it going to make first? Or which nucleus is, is, I guess, more energy required to make, you might say? Yeah, the neutrons. Yeah, the, the neutrons are, are more difficult to make, right? Yeah. Not much more, okay? But you can imagine there's going to be neutrons and protons in the early universe. There's going to be electrons. There's going to be neutrinos. There's going to be a lot of reactions going on. That's going to change the number of neutrons and protons. It takes more energy to make a neutron than it does to make a proton, okay? So after we get to this point where we start making baryons, this quark-hadron transition, now those baryons are going to interact. It's still too hot to make atomic nuclei. Uh, yeah, too hot to make nuclei, but we still have neutrons, protons, electrons, and neutrinos, and photons, and we can do all kinds of reactions and turn neutrons into protons back and forth. So let me show you how that works. How do you take the charge to, to go from a neutron to a proton? Um, oh, good. Yeah, so how do I turn a neutron to a proton? Um, uh, what else do we know about neutrons? They have zero charge and, and they decay. They have a half-life, right? You, you, you'll not, you can't find a stable neutron. I, I can't have something that's made out of pure neutrons. Okay. Their, their half-life is about 880 seconds. Okay. But a neutron decays to a proton. Why? L less mass. It, it's, it, it's easier to, it can give up some energy and go to a lower baryon state, is what we like to say. What? Uh, if the, if the half-life of a neutron is so short, why do we have neutron of a lambda? Say that again? Why, how can uh, the half-life of a neutron be so short if we have neutron of a lambda? Yeah, ha half-life of a, of a free neutron. Okay, okay yeah, yeah. Neutrons in, in nuclei, of course, they're trading you know, it's just think of it. It's kind of the soup of protons and neutrons, and, and they're trading energy back and forth. It's it's a free neutron you can't have. How about the neutron stars? Uh, oh, that's a different animal. In neutron stars, yeah, you can have free neutrons, and 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 that's a um, uh, I, I might be talking about them Monday. I can't remember. Um, in neutron stars, of course, it's much more dense. Um, you have uh, gravity holding the star together. In neutron stars, you have a lot of energy. Okay. Neutron stars are the result of, of a supernova explosion. Um, when you compress matter so densely, it, it, you have to put that energy somewhere and you can put it into a neutron mass. Okay. Uh, and, and you also undergo things, what we call de leptonization, where all, all these neutrinos leave, all these electrons leave, and they turn into to neutrons as well. It's a really interesting process. Okay. I, in fact, some people think of neutron stars as like big atomic nuclei. You know, like they're, they're a little denser, but they can think of that. So let's... But only they, neutron stars are denser than nuclei? Uh, uh, at the surface of a neutron star, the density is about um, uh, one, about... Uh, the density at the surface of a neutron star is about, um, it can vary, I believe it's about 10 to the 10 grams per 
cubic centimeter. Now, now this is a rough, rough number because neutron stars have atmospheres and stuff. So where you call the surface uh, varies. In, inside the neutron star at the core, the, the density can be um, it, 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 as high as 10 to the 15 or, or 10 to the 16 grams per cubic centimeter. This is nuclear density right here. And so it could, it could be 10 times in some cases. And, and we're not sure what happens when nuclei get that dense, but it's quite interesting. This, by the way, is a huge field of study as well. What are the insides of neutron stars like? Other questions? Okay. So let me go on to the next one here. Um, Hi, I want. To yep. Okay, when did the strange mass uh, partially form in this universe? Oh, when did this um, uh, strange uh, strange quark form? Yeah, yeah quark. That, that that would have been after the um, electroweak, uh, what we call electroweak decoupling. That would have been about the same time a top quark formed, or, or maybe even just a little after a top quark. Yep. So it's so very early on. Yep. So in my table that I showed, it would have been like the first line or something like that. Okay. So. In the early universe, we have neutrons and protons, we have electrons and neutrinos, we have a lot of photons. And so these reactions were taking place, okay? Um, we have neutrons capturing electrons, they make an anti uh, capturing positrons, they make an anti-neutrino and a proton, and it goes in the opposite direction as well. So this reaction is going back and forth. And we also have neutrons capturing neutrinos, and it becomes a, a proton and electron, and that's going back and forth as well. And then this blue one is, is, is neutron decay, okay? Neutron beta decay, right? Uh, I made a typo here. Um, that, that, that should be a neutrino. That should be a Greek letter nu there, okay? So you see my typo there? Greek letter nu, yep, okay? Now, as the universe is moving along, these reactions dominate. These reactions are much, much faster than neutron decay. So the lifetime of those reactions might be seconds or something. Why do you think those reactions dominate? Because it makes protons. Um, there's like an equilibrium, right? Why else? The universe is very, very dense, right? So when we say those reactions dominate, we say they're faster than new. Okay. Um, what makes a reaction go fast? Temperature and density, right? So those reactions are fast. Eventually, those reactions do what we call freezing out. You, you hear that a lot. In, in astrophysics, a reaction freezes out. It means it, it just doesn't really happen anymore, okay? Or it's exceeded by other reactions. What, what makes the time scale for these reactions slow down? Temperature. Tem temperature and density. Yep, temperature density, right? The density is getting lower. The, you, you don't have too many neutrons and electrons close to each other, and, and, and those reactions slow down. Okay. At this point, we're kind of at about um, maybe between one second and, and one minute is the age of the universe. Okay. So those reactions get so slow that their reaction rates are much less than the neutron beta decay rate. So we can ju just use thermodynamics. Um, uh, I'm not going to show this to you. I'm not going to prove this, but but it's just a result of a uh, what we call a partition function. Okay, you can use thermodynamics. Actually, it's it's not too hard to think about because you see this in chemistry too. What, what what is this, by the way? What is the mass of a neutron minus mass of a proton in terms of nuclear reactions? There, we heard that term a couple days ago. The electron density. Um. Yep. Yep. Even simpler, this is a Q value of the reaction, right? 
it's how much energy it's going to take to turn one to the other. Okay. And of course, we don't include um, the, the electrons because when you go through both reactions, it's, it's very tiny. But you think of this as a Q value, this kind of tells you how prevalent that reaction is. And then you have some, some other terms. But when you look at, say, a simple reaction network, this is ultimately what you get. This is the neutron to proton ratio after those reactions freeze out. Okay, so, so this equation here corresponds to these reactions, right? That equation there is those reactions, right? Now those reactions freeze out, they basically stop and the neutrons decay. And that's just radioactive decay. Okay, so at that point, the neutron to proton ratio is whatever it was after the freeze out and times the radioactive decay law times the time that the neutrons go until Big Bang nucleosynthesis starts and over the neutron decay constant. So I said the, um, by the way, I said, um, now let me, let me go on because there's an interesting point I wanna make. So here, for example, is a graph on the left side of the neutron to proton ratio as a function of time, okay? Um, this blue line, Actually, let me show the dotted line first. If I just had all neutrons in a box and, and uh, the temperature was really low, they would just decay eventually. And so this dotted line would be neutron decay. Okay, you, you can see this is a logarithmic scale. So, so they don't really decay until after close to a thousand seconds or so. Okay. Now this, 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 um, this blue line, th this is kind of backwards here. This blue line, yeah, I, sh I should have matched the colors better. This, this blue line corresponds to um, th this right here. As the temperature is dropping, these reactions are, are going back and forth. And this would be the, the equilibrium neutron to proton ratio. That's this value here, okay? Um, that reaction is going to freeze out. And then this reaction is going to take over the neutrons are going to start to decay, okay? So this reaction takes over. And then at some point, Big Bang nucleosynthesis starts. How come the, the neutrons drop quite a bit here? Why do they drop so fast at that point? The temperature is very low and the density is very high. And on it, it's very low. Uh, the density is still pretty, pretty high compared to other things. Where, where, are, where are they going? They're made in the nuclei, yeah, yeah. So free neutrons go away. Now we start making nuclei, okay? So that's the point. This is the point right here, you know, at, at this point where we're interested in. This is where we're interested in the neutron to proton ratio. So first of all, you have neutrons and protons trading electrons and neutrinos back and forth. And then the universe is gonna get so sparse that the neutrons are just gonna start decaying a little bit. And depending on how much time has elapsed before the temperature drops enough so that we can start making nuclei, you're going to have some neutrons left. And that's gonna dictate what happens in Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And by the way, this here, this here, this is a very, very big topic in astrophysics today. What is the neutron lifetime? It seems like it would be easy to measure, but, but it turns out there's, at, at least two different classes of experiments that measure the neutron lifetime, and they don't agree. And, and you really wanna, uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis is really sensitive to the neutron lifetime. So, so this is really interesting. If this is a field you wanna go into, you can, you can make a lot of, lot of interesting discoveries here. And hopefully you can figure out what's going on. Because right now, um, there's some disagreement what the neutron lifetime is. Because neutrons are hard. To, neutrons are hard. Um, I, I've done neutron experiments. Um, Professor Kirobini has done neutron experiments. Uh, they're, they're very difficult. I, I usually want to die at the end of a neutron experiment. Okay. Um, okay, then one more thing. Um, I just want to mention the baryon to photon ratio. Remember I said neutron to proton ratio is important, but so is the baryon to photon ratio. How many photons are 
it gives us an idea of how hot the universe is when nucleosynthesis starts. Um, I won't go into it too much, um, but just so you know, just so you know, we use this letter eta to determine the baryon to photon ratio. Okay, so just, just remember that. If you're interested in the math, you can look at it. Okay, eta is defined to be the baryon to photon ratio. Um, this number here, this omega, that is a parameter. Okay, that's a parameter of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Um, that's something we get from observation, right? That's something we, we have to put all the pieces together and figure out what omega is. This, this rho sub c, that's the critical density of the universe. That's the density, the smallest density you can have for the universe to keep expanding, okay? Or the largest. If the density is too big, the universe will collapse on itself, right? Too much mass. If the density is too small, the universe continues to expand at a faster rate, okay? So, so that, that we can determine, that we can determine. Um, in fact, that, that's been defined here to be this quantity here. That comes from the Friedman equations. If you're interested in that, that's just in a cosmology book. Um, and then the, the number of photons. And then of course we express our critical density in, in terms of neutron mass here. Now, you don't need to understand that so much except to, to understand that this is uh, uh, something in the universe that is going to affect Big Bang nucleosynthesis. If you have too many photons, you have more nuclei breaking up. If you have too many baryons, you're gonna form heavier things. So that becomes important. Um, we determine the baryon ratio just by looking at cosmic abundances in mass. We, we effectively use uh, uh, gravity. We, we, we know how big galaxies are. We see how quickly they move. Uh, um, we're able to determine how much mass is, is there. And the photon ratio, a number of photons we get from cosmic microwave background radiation. Okay. All right. Um, so there's that. That's important. We take all that information. And at the start of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, we have a, a temperature. We have a density. And we have number of neutrons and we have number of protons. And we could put all that into something that we saw yesterday. You recognize this, right? Yeah, what is that? The, the number of uh, uh, reactions that uh, an atom has to meet another. Yep, yep, it's a nuclear reaction network. Yep, that's it. Yep, table of isotopes. You can calculate this on your, on your computer. In fact, there's web pages you can go to to calculate this, but it takes all of the nuclei produced in Big Bang nucleosynthesis and all of the reactions, and you calculate that as a function of time. So here's one calculation I did. Here's one calculation I did um, where I'm just looking at the, the mass fraction of different elements, protons, deuterons, tritons, and all these things. As, as a function of time, this is a logarithmic scale. This is 100 seconds, 1,000 seconds, 10,000. You can see at, at, at some point, at some point, they become more or less an equilibrium value. The nucleosynthesis stops. Why, why, why does the nucleosynthesis stop at some point? Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. it freezes up, right? Density gets too low. Temperature gets too low. It, it gets to an equilibrium value. Yep. And so those reactions effectively stop. Um, except for in this calculation, anyway. Except for this one. What? What? Why, why is this one still going down? It's a neutron. Yep. It's a neutron. Yep. And so we can do different models. We can make different assumptions about the baryon to photon ratio. We can make different assumptions about the the um, neutron to uh, proton ratio. We can use different models to determine that. And we can, we can change the parameters in our calculation here. It's like turning knobs on a machine and see how this figure changes. And so let me show you something. Let me show you a figure. 
we can make a figure like, like this. Okay, take a look at the bottom, uh, baryon to photon ratio. So, so if I change the baryon to photon ratio, okay, if I change the baryon to photon ratio in my calculation, I can determine the ratio of say lithium seven to hydrogen using my nuclear reaction network. So I know how much hydrogen came out the end. I know how much lithium-7 came out the other end. And it depends on the baryon to photon ratio. If I uh, change the baryon to photon ratio, I can determine um, how much helium-4 comes out. And I can determine how much deuterium comes out, how much helium-3 comes out. Now, I already told you we, we, we got the baryon to photon ratio from looking at something else. What did we look at to get the baryon to photon ratio? Cosmic microwave background. Yes, cosmic microwave background. So we know what it is, okay? It turns out the cosmic microwave background, we know fairly accurately to be right in that region right there, okay? So in my model, I can match the cosmic microwave background to the number of elements I got and take a look. There's something more interesting. So, so I'm looking at my model here. I say the cosmic microwave background is this. That means I expect this much helium-4. I expect this much deuterium. I expect this much helium-3. And I expect this much lithium-7. But we can look at very old stars. We can look at very old galaxies. We can look at the spectra of very high Far, a very high reg of very far away objects, and we can determine how much deuterium, helium, and, and lithium are in those objects and get an idea of what, what Big Bang nucleosynthesis really looked like. Okay, And that's what these yellow squares are. The yellow squares are observations. It includes the uncertainties. Okay, So we know helium-4 is somewhere in this region here. We, we've seen it. We've measured it. We've measured deuterium to be somewhere in this region here. We've measured lithium-7 to be somewhere in this region here. Do you see a problem? It doesn't matter. Lithium. 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 It doesn't match. That's exactly it. We have been working on this problem for close to 50 years, and we have no idea why, there's, why, why there is so little lithium in the universe. If you can solve this problem, you, you will be famous. Okay, this is one of the biggest problems in, in um, astrophysics today, this, this lithium problem. Yes? Um, how come the deuterium and helium uh, decrease as the photon ratio increase? Yeah, how come? Yeah. Yeah, good question. How come deuterium and helium 3 decrease? Um, uh, let me try to think of, for, to answer that, I have to go back and think about what the reactions are that create those and what the reactions are that destroy those. Um, deuterium and helium-3 are both pretty delicate elements. Uh, it doesn't take too much to destroy them. Um, also, uh, um, you can get a lot of deuterium that comes together to, to make alpha particles. And helium-3 can capture a neutron pretty easy to make alpha. Alphas are nice tightly bound. I can even make guesses by going back and looking at this network here, right? See, deuterium goes up a little bit, but, but then it goes, goes down. Um, as it goes down, helium-3 is, is going up. So maybe deuterium is turning into helium-3 by capturing a proton, maybe, and, and, and that could be happening. Helium-3 starts off really low to begin with, uh, um, just because it's not made early on. You usually make the deuterium quite a bit. So I, I would say looking at the network here, it looks to me like deuterium is probably turning into helium-3. Um, so so the, the, these are kind of fun models because you can look at them and see what goes up when someone else goes down. Yeah. So lithium-7 is one of the biggest problems in astrophysics today. I've written a couple papers on lithium-7 and have gotten absolutely nowhere. Um, uh, we're pretty sure what we know about cosmology is, is right. We're pretty sure the nuclear reactions are right. We're, we're pretty sure. There might be something with, with 
some exotic physics that we don't know about. But if you want to go on and study astrophysics, that lithium seven problem um, would definitely be a fun. Pro well, I don't know if it'll be fun. It's it's frustrating, <laughs> but but, but you, you won't lose your job anyway. Okay, here's where we set. Um, we have elements. We have nuclei. We have atoms. Now we can make some stars. Now we can make some planets. Now we can make some galaxies. Now we can make some life. Okay. And that's what we're going to do next time. Okay. Have a good weekend, everyone. Excuse me, one question. Yep. Is the, the fact that the universe is expanding uh, related somehow with the, the concept of uh, inertia? Uh, is the fact that um, the universe is expanding related to inertia? Um, yeah, on a mechanical level, right? Because it, if you think about it, what, what are the forces in the universe? If there were no gravity, right, the universe would just keep expanding, right? Of course, we have gravity, and so so that could slow things down, and that's why we have things like a critical density, which, which can, can, could slow the expansion if it were too much, okay? If it were too little, then it would continue. So so certainly inertia comes comes into play there. Yep. yep. Other questions? Yep. In the acceleration that uh, is expanding our universe, slowing down or maybe speeding up or remaining? Yeah, is the acceleration slowing down or speeding up? I don't know. I, I don't know. That's a really good question. There's a lot of physicists who are trying to figure out exactly what it is. I don't think we even know what it is. What, what's that? Uh, the velocity is going up, um, but I don't know if the acceleration is. Uh, okay. 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 That's interesting. Yeah. I, I, I haven't read anything, but that. Um, yeah, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't read any. It's it's outside my area of expertise. Um, but um, re remember, velocity is, acceleration is change in velocity, right? So you can have a constant acceleration, but still increase in velocity. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Yeah, as far as I know, we don't even know what's causing this. We call it dark energy, but we're not even sure what causes it at, at this point. I, I have some friends who are really, really smart physicists who are spending a lot of time thinking about this, and, and they're just crazy. <laughs> I, I think I think it drove them crazy is what happened. So we shouldn't start uh, studying this. Oh, I think you should. I, I think you should try to figure it out. I'd, I'd love to know. I mean, uh, if, if, if it's going down, it means that there's no, uh, uh, there's no force that is uh, uh, contributing to this acceleration. Even if it's remaining constant or it's speeding up, it means that there's a force right. going on. So right, right, but, yeah, yeah. And we know the fact is that uh, as we saw, if, if the, the dark energy density is uh, the same uh, uh, while the universe is, is expanding, the uh, the acceleration has to go up because the the force of gravity, which um, Counter the the acceleration of the, of the of the dark energy drops as density decreases. So so if that is correct, it has to go up. And I think. But there will eventually be a point where it stops, and then the gravity, even if it's very little, can pull everything yeah. back together. But if the um, if the density of the dark energy Cost constant, it can happen. But it's uh, the density of the dark energy isn't something, maybe isn't something that actually exists. It's just a theory. Yeah, I said if that's the case. Yeah, if, if, I mean, if dark energy exists and the universe is expanding, you know, the dark energy density could be dropping as well. Uh, sure, but you know, it could follow a different equation of state. Yeah, we just don't know. As we know, it, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, the, yeah, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't know enough about it, but yeah, you know, it could be, you know, we just don't know, but yeah, it, it could be constant, could be linear. Anyway, I, I have a, a question about the equilibrium mass of, of the universe. 
we know that if we, if the mass of the universe is below the critical one, the universe will eventually uh, compress on itself. If it's if it's uh, larger, it will, will keep expanding, which is what we are measuring right now. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's the other way around, but I understand what you're saying anyway. What? I think I think it's the other way around. If, if the... Oh, yeah, yeah, it, okay. it, it, uh, okay. the other way around. Sorry. Oh, that's but okay. We, what I, I, I heard that, what the, that there is another um, possible outcome of the end of the universe, which was called uh, the Big Rip, I think, which will happen if the um, force of expansion becomes greater than the nuclear force. But how does, does that relate to the the critical mass. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I've heard of what you're saying. So, so there's this, you know, we, we think of what we call the curvature of the universe. You know, is it going to expand constantly or is it going to expand and then decrease or is it going to expand and keep expanding faster, right? Um, I, I'm not sure what that would do for, for nuclear physics I, um, because it would just get, get uh, should continue to get cold. So, uh, um, you know, eventually, I mean, eventually, you're you're just going to have stars that 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 all the stars are going to burn out in the universe. You'll have stars that go supernova, turn to black holes, or, or um, uh, you might have neutron stars, and their fate could could be that they just cool off, maybe become a black hole. I don't know. Uh, um, I, I don't think it would rip nuclei apart, but it would also be a very depressing universe to live in. Everything would just be yeah, dark. I, you know? I heard that was a possibility. Yeah. But as we are right now, we are measuring that that's not going to happen as we are right now. Mm -hmm. So I I just wonder. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't be scared of it. It's not going to happen for a couple billion years, I think. Not, not, not for sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we, we should start thinking, I mean, but... I don't think you have to pack your bags and move to another universe at this point. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I've heard of it. I'm not, I, I have to say I haven't studied it enough to really know exactly what, what it means. We keep the bags right. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are some really good cosmology books if you're if you're interested in this. Um, one that uh, one that I really like, um, although not not everyone likes this one is. Is written by Peebles. I think he just won a Nobel Prize recently. I can't remember. Um, it's a, it's a really good book. Uh, uh, pretty easy to understand, but, but there's a bunch of other ones out there as well. There's a, many others out there as well. But he talks about you know the expansion and co-moving volumes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think that's it then, right? Okay, everyone, I'm going to log out of Teams now, so I hope you have a good weekend. You too. Goodbye. 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 Bye-bye. Mike, I will phone you later. <laughs>